here, so there wasn't really much uh, to uh, that we could say at the time. So, but, but acknowledgement, what you just did was uh, is a uh, is huge in our community when somebody says, "Me ah, It's good that you arrived on our land. You know, now, the Canadians who first came here maybe really appreciated arriving here and made good relations initially, but then they saw other things beyond the people that were there. And so they didn't really acknowledge the way that you are doing. And to acknowledge, I guess, is uh, to try to make some sense of uh, what the people did here, you know, who they are by naming them. You know, I'm a Nihio, right? Nihio. Nihio is where I come from. And I, my mother's side is Woodland Cree, and my father's side is Plains Cree. And there's also a mix of, of, of Métis in there. So, you know, acknowledgement, that's only that's a beginning. It's good to say, like, for example, when your people came here, like when you arrived here, we would call you Omantiwak. Yes, like you said, you know, Omantiwak. And Omantiwak basically means you don't know how long you're going to be here. You know, you've come and arrived here. So we call you, oh, Omanti, look, these are people that have come from another community or from another country. And we don't know how long they're here, but by saying that, we still acknowledge that you you exist, you're a visitor. But we don't really know who you are. When you go further into that relationship, then you become Nuakumaganek. You become my relatives, my brother, my sister. You know, but it's always based on uh, whether I, I have to get to know your heart and your soul. I have to learn to trust you. To me, that's acknowledgement. You have to trust the people that arrive here and you get to know them. But initially, you just call them a mantiog, you know, they're just passing through, which that's, you know, basically means that, you know, you're just a guest. And until such time that the communities around here who originally lived here welcome you, and say that I'm Scott now, I greet you in your language. You know, we also know that the routine is good that you arrived. You know, you just continue that from there. You go from there and then you develop a relationship gradually getting to know each other. Thank you so much. Thank you for um, teaching us today. And I have another question. Um, what are some of the common strengths or values or practices that indigenous peoples and new Canadians share? Okay, indigenous people and new Canadians. Uh, one of the things that I am noticing is that, because I uh, sometimes catch taxi around here, you know, and sometimes I just uh, I meet newcomers or immigrants or refugees, you know, that have come to this territory. And uh, just like our people, you know, they, they seem, they, they look indigenous, you know, but I don't know what their their uh, relationship is back home, you know, whether they were also colonized. But uh, they seem to know more than the, ge the general Canadian about what happened here. As I was in a cab one time, and, and uh, this fellow might have been, from, I think, from Pakistan, and he says, I was talking to my daughter, and my daughter was learning about the residential schools, you know. And she, so he didn't know about it until his daughter was uh, told about what happened on this land, you know, with kids being abducted, you know, and kidnapped from the from the reser reserves. But they were they were not. They put them on reserves at first. They put us on reserves, and then they abducted us and kidnapped us and put us in these residential schools. So, I think does that does that answer that question for now? Sometimes I'll have to keep asking you. <laughs> what the question was because I get rolling yeah. and then I got back back mm -hmm. um, so how do we build awareness of indigenous and newcomer realities and make sure we learn from the past well you're coming to a territory which is compromised you know there's the things that have happened here happened in spite of the uh, indigenous people being uh, Approached, you know, they, in spite of them being living here all all this time, nobody said, "Can we come and you know, can we come and share this land with you?" We signed a treaty with your ancestors. Nobody said that. They just start surveying the land, you know, back in the 1800s, 
and without the people, our people were just watching them. You know, they, well, who are these people? They're, they've got these surveyors, you know, walking through the land and marking the land and measuring it, and you know that's what happened here. They just went walk right into our territory and just started measuring the land as if it was theirs, it, as, if, as if they didn't see us and we were there. You know, we were watching them and they were living right. They could see us, and they could see my ancestors, my grand elders and grandparents, you know. They could see them, but they just went right ahead. But so, you know, how do you, uh, how do you bring that to today's understanding you know, with the immigrants that are here and tell them, please don't do the same thing, you know. Please respect the land and, and recognize that, like you were saying, that you're, you know, you're a guest here. I recognize that other people have lived here, and those people that lived here, Nihiawak, you know, in Kwatak, Apitogosanak, you know, Anishinaabe, even Sequepnik, you know, out of BC, the Shushwap, they lived here as well, too. You know, the Blackfoot, I'm naming these in their language because that's how we name them, and, and it's important to name name them because that's that's acknowledges who lived here and you know, who actually was here initially. So you have to uh, recognize that these are different nations that are here and rather than ignore them, like the Canadian government did, you know. I don't know, where else do we go from there? <laughs> Thank you, Joseph, uh, yeah. for your uh, wisdom, knowledge, and sharing your uh, how we can uh, mm -hmm. learn from you. We really appreciate uh, your your suggestion and also recommendation for newcomers. Yeah. My question is, when we come to this land, in indigenous land, yeah. uh, we many of uh, immigrant and refugee communities, we don't know, we come, we don't know what is the meaning of uh, land in this land. Right. So I was wondering, uh, how do you explain the meanings of land for the newcomer and uh, immigrant communities? You know, that's uh, because in the past, you know, it was, uh, everything was happened at the federal level, like the Canadian government, right? And then the provinces came into being, and we never made an agreement with the provinces like Saskatchewan. There was never an agreement about how this land would be shared and, you know, what could happen on this land. There was, there was never a deal like that. It just... The settlers just did it without asking, you know. Now, you're asking me about newcomers. Newcomers need to go to the tribal councils or need to go to the hereditary chiefs from this territory and the leadership and perhaps ask their permission if they can, you know, buy and purchase land from this territory. That doesn't happen. The government, you know, the, they just provincial government, they sell the land to newcomers as if nobody lived there, you know, as if they're on, they, we, we signed a treaty with the government, yet nobody honors the treaty. There, there are efforts to teach it now in the schools, right? So with newcomers, I think it would be really um, first, I guess if uh, like they went to the chief, the hereditary chiefs, there's two different levels of leadership here. There's hereditary chiefs, and then there's a, the chief and council, which is basically a, um, maybe they're, uh, it's really hard to talk about this sometimes because we don't really recognize often, you know, the leadership that's uh, defined by government, you know, as the leadership. The true leaders are the ones that are hereditary to the land. They've always been, it's the old custom, they've always been the leaders in my mind. You know, I'm a hereditary chief in my family, in my namesake, you know. That's, that's, that's a given, right? But the government created these uh, reserves and then they created this uh, kind of like a leadership model based based on their government, you know, their, their, the way that they do things. And it was a way to control the people. And so, you know, we had... Just a little, like back home in Sturgeon Lake, we have 10 square miles. It's getting increasing more with treaty land entitlement because the government is starting to be open to returning lands that have been stolen. So, you know, that's uh, like the, in that situation itself, you know, they're starting to make changes, but still, those chief and council, 
are still dictated by the government. I mean, they have almost complete control. We don't have self-reliance. We don't have a, you know, like a financial base to run our own governments. We should have had that because we, we had technically owned the, all this territory, but who benefited? <laughs> the settlers benefited. The, the new, you know, newcomers are benefiting today because they're buying out land through deals with the government, since uh, the provincial governments now. So they're taking up land that they don't realize was, again, you know, it was a uh, stolen land. So just acknowledge that, okay, I'm on Treaty 4 territory, I'm on Treaty 6, I'm on Treaty 2, Treaty 3, and Anishinaabe are there, you know, the Nihilg are there, you know, all this, you know, you have to acknowledge and, and approach them, go right to their, their home and say, I'm sorry, but uh, I made a deal with the government, the problems here, I bought land over here, how should I, how should I live on it? How should I honor and respect this relationship? It's a matter of just communicating and asking them and creating a relationship, a new one, right? You know, because it never happened before. It never happened before. And I can tell you that because back in my territory in Sturgeon Lake, the land, you know, we used to go to Church River, Candle Lake, all those places, you know, just north of uh, of uh, Sturgeon Lake by Prince Albert. We used to go out around that area hunting and gathering and we just live out there in the summertime. But as soon as I was taking the residential school, bang, this uh, this land base just decreased slower and slower. My grandmother once used to go out to the land and pick medicine, you know, skin the moose over there, make dry meat, you know, and then we just lived beautifully. It was pristine. The land was very clean. And, and then we... Uh, I went, kept going home in the summertime because I was in Prince.